Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Influencing Up. My name is Patrick Allen, and I am the Program Manager for Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development's Public Open Enrollment Programs. Our center specializes in providing employee development for partnering organizations in Northeast Ohio and around the country. We offer training as public open enrollment programs delivered in Independence, Ohio, and also on-site customized programs delivered at your location. I'm joined today by Kent State Facilitator Amy Shannon. I will be serving as your host and Amy will be our presenter for today. Amy has specialized in organizational development, human resources, and training for over 20 years. She facilitates programs such as leadership development, coaching, trust, workplace bullying, and many other topics. She has worked with organizations in most industries, including manufacturing, service, financial, and healthcare. Her background also includes functioning as a human resource director in both service and manufacturing organizations. Amy is a recognized speaker at local and national conferences, including the Corporate University Week at the Disney Institute. Amy is also a certified mediator and holds a Bachelor of Arts in Human Resources from the University of Kentucky. If you have not done, done so, please download the handout available on the right side of your screen under the tab Handouts, as Amy will be referring to it often during her presentation. Everyone in attendance has been muted to avoid background noise from any of the over 300 registered participants. We do encourage you to ask questions at any point during the hour. You can submit your questions in writing using the control panel on the right side of your screen. I will present your questions to the presenter as time permits throughout the webinar. We are recording today's webinar and you will receive an email with a link to the recording after we have concluded our time together. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Amy Shannon. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. I'm excited to be here, and I think thank you all for participating, and congratulations to each of you for joining in and continuing to develop your own personal development in an area that I find to be one of the most interesting out there, and that is influencing, and how do we influence other people. In my program, I always ask the question, how many of you have been to the grocery store and they offer you a piece of cheese, and in return, what are they looking for? Well, what they're doing is they're trying to influence you to purchase that chunk of cheese. That's what we're talking about today, is how do we, in our society, influence others? I'm sure many of you guys have mastered the opportunity to influence your loved ones as to what restaurants you're going to go to on Saturday night, what movie you might be attending on Saturday after dinner. So those type of skills are what we're going to bring to your attention today, and specifically, we're going to learn what is your default behavior. And how is that working in the workplace, in particular with the bosses and senior management? So as well as the introduction that uh, Jason just gave me for my background, I'm also one of the things I want to add is I'm also an executive coach. And in the area of executive coaching, I always talk about, well, how do you get people to change? What is the reason that people change? How do we do that? And as you can see on the slide in front of you, I'm curious to what your thoughts are on how do you get anyone to do anything and to change and influence them. So if you have a piece of paper in front of you, jot down what do you think the reason is that individuals change. All right, I'll give you two seconds to do that and then we're going to switch over to the answer. Humans change for two reasons, pain or pleasure. The question becomes, do they have too much pain that they need help and they want to change to get away from that pain or are they looking for pleasure, i.e. promotions and moving up? Pain or pleasure are key to what we're getting ready to talk about, as well as helping and working with others. If you're a leader, you've probably already figured this out. But when you're looking to change or influence someone, whether it be coaching or influencing or motivating, whatever the topic is and whatever it is you're trying to do, the key is how you link the pain or pleasure to the conversation. So we're going to come back to this, but make a note somewhere on your paper, humans change for these two reasons. All right, let's get started and let's start with our first activity. On that piece of paper that I hope you have in front of you, if you would, please help me out by writing down your favorite hobby. What is your favorite sport? What's your favorite activity? Jot it down. I'll give you a minute to do that. All right, so hopefully you have your favorite hobby down, your favorite pastime. Could be anything. Uh, it could be, as you see on my slide there, it could be fishing, it could be uh, 
needle point. It could be that you like to go rock climbing. Whatever it is, jot it down. Now we're going to do something probably a little unique for a webinar. You're going to help and you're, you're going to influence me on how to stop my hobby and, and turn on your hobby in my pastime. So my favorite thing to do, guys, is uh, in the evening, I enjoy watching crime shows. My favorite one is Blue Blood. All right, so here's your challenge. You have your favorite hobby picked out. You're going to, in the next two to three minutes, Jot down on paper how you would, or better yet, say it out loud, how you would change and influence me to stop my hobby and adopt your hobby. Okay? So I'm going to give you a minute. Um, jot down how you would say it, or if you want to say it out loud, that's fine. If you're in a cubicle, I need you to write it down, though, because you're going to uncover what your default behavior style is in influencing other people. So if you don't say it out loud, that's fine. But write down what three or four sentences you would write just on a piece of paper because you will then uncover what your default style is and how to influence me. So stop my hobby and start your hobby of crocheting, cooking, bird watching, rock climbing, whatever it might be. All right, so you got one minute. All right, 10 seconds left. All right, I'm curious to hear how many of you guys were able to influence me to stop watching my blue blood. Let's figure it out. Next slide, what I'm getting ready to do is introduce to you the nine types and the techniques that we use in our society to influence others. They're based on six key principles of our behavior. The example I gave you earlier of someone giving you a piece of cheese in the grocery store in hopes that you'll in return purchase their cube of cheese is reciprocity. These nine techniques I'm getting ready to introduce to you are based on those six behaviors, and we go through those in our training class here at Kent. The, I'm going to introduce to you all nine, but I want to point out that the top four are the most popular, frequently used, as well as the ones that preserve a relationship. And we'll talk about how important that is, especially as we influence upward upper management, the boss, or whoever that might be. As we go through this, the what I'd like to do is ask you to think about these hobbies that you tried to influence me uh, to change and identify where is your default as well as, as you go through here, I'd like you to think about what technique you're using to try to influence your boss or upper management, as well as possibly what they might use with you. And certainly along the way, you can ponder any loved one. First and foremost, the most popular one is where we're going to stop in the upper left-hand corner or right-hand corner, depending on your slide, is logic. Logic is the one that you see here and here the most in the workplace. The concept is to give exactly what you're, think, you're thinking about, a reasonable background on for someone to change the behavior that they're doing or influence their decision making. That is step-by-step -step factual information. An example there that you'll see on my slide is very logical, you know, is very much um, factual in that these two are two reasons that won't work, and we have this prototype that we used before and after, et cetera. So very much methodical going through step-by-step Possibly you'll see statistics, data, and behind the logic. When do you want to use logic? Now, by the way, folks, if you have your handout next to you, you will follow along everything that you see on my slide. So please feel free to follow right along there for you, with me. And again, you can write on that piece of paper as well if this is your default one. 
when to use it. You want to use it when you know somebody else is influenced by logic. Um, as, a, as an executive coach, I see a lot of the, the financial people I work with, the engineering folks, they're very logical. This is a technique that I would use with them. If you're, we're, if you're looking at the slide, you'll see the last box there is backfire. The one, this is for, for you to recognize when you may not want to use this. This is a technique. Um, the technique will not work if you do not have the correct facts. Um, you also lose some credibility there, obviously. So if your reasoning doesn't have the information, um, if you don't have the evidence that you need to go through a conversation with someone with the information or you don't have a deep uh, statistics, possibly you want to stay away from this particular one. Uh, the second one is inspiration. Inspiration is one that I see a lot of people using uh, in um, management, those of you that might be in management. The concept is suggesting what might happen as opposed to the fact-based reason. I see this a lot with organizations that I work with that are looking to grow. Um, this appeals to emotions, and uh, it's a very exciting one. And also, and we're going to talk about the delivery of this one. The, the delivery is key in this one. Let me share with you the example. The example that I have here, and I'm going to use my voice to demonstrate it. Imagine that we have created a large client base all over the U.S., and we can start our aggressive advertising campaign and show the world what we're capable of. So the enthusiasm in your voice, you're going to hear me say in just a moment, is very important. But this is where you're getting people excited. I see this particular technique used a lot with the sales people I work with in coaching, um, the marketing folks, um, because there is that enthusiasm. It's great to use, next um, block there, when to use it is when you don't have the facts or evidence, when you're excited, when you're passionate, and you want to get them involved. The delivery is the back part, though. you got to make sure that you can use that motivational, excited, uh, enthusiastic tone in your voice so that you can share with your passion with them. So those of you that may have been tried to influence me using this one to turn off my blue bloods and start rock climbing, there would be a, a lot of motivation in your voice there and passion around that particular hop. The next one, the third one of the, of the top four, remember the top four, the most popular as well as the ones that preserve the relationship, is the one that I use the most, and that is participation. As an executive coach, it's critical. The secret to coaching folks, I'll tell you right up front, is getting it out of their mouth. The secret to getting anyone to change behavior is out of their mouth. So participation is my best friend. The concept is to ask a number of, of questions where it gets the person to come to their own conclusion. I used open-ended questions, the how of what, to get it out of their mouth. The example, which I have, I'm going to bring through on the slide right now, is um, an individual who is um, trying, to, a salesperson who's trying to sell someone a backup system to their computer. And you can take a look at the example where the person is, hey, do you have a computer used on a daily basis? The salesperson or the Individual is yes, I do. The salesperson comes back and asks, you produce a lot of data. So you can see they go back and forth, and the outcome is then getting it out of their mouth, yes, I do need a backup system. So that's the concept on participation. When to use it, this, folks, is what I highly encourage you to use when you're influencing someone who is more powerful than you. This is very effective because they wants to come out of their mouth, they want to be their idea, and they might feel a part of that and more ownership. It, the backfire piece of this one is it's difficult to use when you don't know where the person's going to go. Questioning is like a funnel. If you don't know which direction they're going to go to, it's going to be hard to, um, you may not have the answers in advance and you might not be careful. You also want to make sure that your questions are not too broad or they're going to wonder and question where you're going with it or too narrow that they feel that you are trying to capture them or um, lock them into something. So sometimes that can backfire on you. The fourth and final one is, let me go through here, is uplift. Uplift is awesome to use when you are in a boss subordinate relationship. The concept is to make the person feel great about themselves so that they will listen to you. So that's the concept. An example of that would be a boss talking to their employee, hey, you did great on the last project. I know I can count on you next time. I'm sure you're going to be able to do the same great um, results in the future. So that concept is to compliment, to make them feel great about themselves. 
it's wonderful when you're working with someone that has similar power to you, possibly on a team, or less power. It is definitely a backfire, though, with a reverse effect when you're working for someone who is more powerful or that upper management. So consider that. It works great, again, with the, the peers and the subordinates, but I highly would encourage you to stay away from it when you're trying to influence up. These um, group, this is the top, these top four that I just shared with you are the ones that you hear and you see the most common. Now I'm going to go through the other five, but I do want to mention the top four are the ones that what I encourage you to think about. If you um, take a minute and you look at your hobby, your example of where you were trying to influence me to change my hobby and uh, adopt your hobby and see if that one of the four were the ones that you would have used if we were face to face. I also encourage my coaching clients when I work with them, if your default is one of these top four, to consider using some of the other three on a casual basis until you become, you create a habit of using them. So we'll talk more about how you can make some changes in your, uh, your default based on where your box is. So the next one, let's go on to number five. The next one is deal. This is what I call the Monty Hall. Let's make a deal. Remember that TV show? Deal is exactly what you think it is. I'm going to give you something if you give me something. So it's getting something in return for something else. So if you help me out with this, you order by the end of the week, for example, as the example that's on the screen, then I will give you something, a discount, bundle an extra feature, something free, etc. You see that in the stores, uh, you know, how many times have pay less shoes gone out of business, right? Come in by the end of the week. That type, that type of a, a deal gets X percentage off. When to use it? When you want something and you don't mind giving something in return. So if I don't mind giving out a discount or something that it makes sense, it will help build the relationship. The backfire is if I appear to be too naive. Um, if I appear to be not fair, people start flushing that in the deal. So we want to make sure that that is, um, and we do as look as if we are a, a um, fair deal maker. The next one follows along this concept, and it is a favor. And in my training class, I always use the Cub Scouts and the popcorn example, and the Girl Scouts and the Girl Scout cookie. Um, how many of you guys have dealt with someone in the workplace who comes in and says, hey, will you buy my, girl, my daughter's Girl Scout cookie? Uh, help me out. Would you do a favor? That works great as long as I have a relationship with that person and they care about me. Favor is exactly that, asking for something you want. Can you do a favor for me, please? It's powerful when we have that relationship. However, it will backfire when they come in three months later and want you to buy 10, 10 cans of uh, popcorn from the Boy Scouts. So you have to be careful um, because they are, you are setting yourself up for that favor, uh, that ask and the return. Collective is the next one. This is the one that my children use the most on me. Anyone that knows me out there knows I have two teenage boys, and they're constantly, when they were in high school, constantly coming home and saying, hey, mom, everybody in the entire high school has these brand new LeBron, George, or LeBron or Air Jordan, whatever, tennis shoes, and I need a pair of those, mom. That's the concept of collective, using the view of everyone else to influence someone else. This can, use, this can be used very effectively sometimes from the sales department. Uh, for an organization trying to change or, or keep up with the Joneses, if you will, another organization that they're competing with. The example is that. Everybody in the market's upgrading their system. We don't want to be left out. Let's do it. That sometimes works. We want to use it sometimes even with the upper management. Um, it's especially effective, though, if you know that other person cares about what the competition's doing or what, i.e., my children, what all the other kids are wearing to school. The backfire is, um, I have a brother like this who's the backfire. He's the rebel of the family. I'm calling the cowboy. He will go against the crowd. He will um, say, nope, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go there to dinner, whatever, just to go against the crowd. So that's when you're going, it's not going to work if you know somebody likes to be that uh, individual who is unique and different. That's the collective. The last couple ones on your, on your uh, handout, as well as I'm going to go through, are the ones that I highly encourage you to avoid. You're going to hear me say in a few minutes that you can use a combination of these, and many of you are probably thinking that already, that you've used a combination. You can use two or three or maybe four or five in your uh, uh, conversation. These two, these last two, though, are the ones that you want to stay away from, from the perspective if you're looking to continue the relationship with the individual, because it will shut down people. The next one is policy. 
This is showing the power based on a rule. You know, and you'll see the example there is, let me be clear, this is our agency guidelines. If we cannot do business with you, we cannot accept your product because you're not meeting our guidelines. So that is a quick and easy way. I mean, when to use it, quick and easy response, absolutely, it's very blunt. But sometimes it does upset people and sometimes it does deter that relationship. The backfire is exactly that. If you want to continue that relationship, you know, if they think twice about exercising your authority over them. It may work short term, but long term, what have you done to that relationship? And along the same lines is our last one, force. Force is exactly that. I highly encourage we don't use force very much, especially not with our senior management or upper management or whoever you're trying to influence because you're basically taking and exercising all the power you have. If you don't, look at the example there. If you don't comply, I have no choice but to report you. That is pretty extreme. The backfire, use it only in emergencies, as you see. Backfire, of course, is you're going to get the short-term results, just like the, the policy, but you definitely will have a negative impact on your relationship once it's gone. I mean, you possibly will not be able to continue to do business with those individuals. So that is used out there, though. There are times that we might want to use it in an emergency situation. So those are the nine techniques that I wanted to introduce to you. Let's go back and let's look at your hobby example that you did, influencing me to to adopt your hobby. Which one of these did you use? Did you use a combination of them? Think about that. What, did it work? Now let's think about your box. Which one do you use on your box? And is it working? Uh, excuse me, I mean, we did have a question come in um, asking about of all the different techniques and ones that they've never used, how do I teach myself a new technique? Oh, great question, Patrick. And I mentioned that earlier, and I want to share with you what I teach with my coaching clients. What I encourage you to do is, if let's say of the top four, your favorite one, which most people use, is logic. But you feel there could be some advantages to use participation or uplift. What I would encourage you to do would be to uh, look for an opportunity. Pick one. Start just with one a week. Jot down your thoughts of how you would word that. And put some type of a reminder system on your laptop, on your on your um, a rubber band on your bracelet, or your arm, wherever it might be, and use that technique when you interact with the person, and practice it intentional. And then over time, over if you do it consistently three or four times a week, it's going to come, become a hobby. But you're going to have to intentionally identify the situation, identify the person, and identify the words you're going to use. It's not going to come easy. It's like riding a bike. It's like any new skill. But what you will see with the outcome, if you watch that body language of that other individual, and you'll see hopefully engagement from them, where they're facing you, they're positive, they're interacting, and possibly you've been able to influence some of the decisions you make. So great question, Patrick. Thank you. All right. So back to the, the, the PowerPoint um, for a moment. So which one of these are better? There's better. There's not one or two that are better. The top four are the most popular based on the six principles in our society. Logic, inspiration, participation, and uplift are the ones that you see most commonly used in the workforce in a management leadership capacity. We do see deal, favor, and collective more in that sales um, negotiation portion of the organization. And hopefully we don't see a lot of policy or force. I always ask people, too, in the class when we do some activities around this, is are you combining them? Now, we have activities we do where are we looking at what makes sense. If you start combining them, as you can see on my slide, we want to go from soft to hard. We don't want to start at the bottom and go up. We want to save those emergency only. So consider that as you listen to yourself, as you listen to your loved ones on uh, Saturday night, Friday, tomorrow, we're going to go to dinner, we're going to go to a movie, whatever it is you're doing, how you're influencing them and how you're influencing and how they're trying to influence you. So let's talk more, if we could, about specifically the boss. Since we've gone through the nine techniques, big questions for you around influencing us. What is the current technique that you're using with your box? So ponder the nine that we just went through. Is it working? Jot it down on a piece of paper. Circle it. You've got my, my hand out in front of you. What's the technique that they use with you, and is it working? Does everybody know, and you may, may or may not even know? And then, of course, what's the best way? What I have found in the training class is that most people come to the class and they, they've never seen these before. This is all new to them. And they say, wow, I'm always going in and I'm always using um, logic with my boss. But, my, but it's not working. I'm banging my head up against the wall. My head's bleeding. 
I need help. And I say, okay, let's talk about what it, what works with your boss. So we do some ideas, examples, and exercises, and we uncover that the boss might be more participative. They're maybe a little bit more egocentric, and it needs to come out of their mouth. Participation is going to work the best for that. Um, if they're always future focused and they're dreamers, then maybe we need to be using inspiration and back it up with logic. So sometimes we have to uh, change and adjust, and that's certainly one of the components of this program. So which way do you go? Well, I want to introduce to you a great book to read um, for you that I use in the class. A lot of the concepts I use come from this author. This is the, these authors, I should say there's two of them, Alan Cohen and David Bradford. Um, and I encourage you to Google them. If you don't like to read books, I, David Bradford has a great article he just wrote with for Harvard. It's out there. You can download it. But it's a synopsis of the book, Influencing Up. Um, they've written a couple books. They've written Influencing Without Authority. Um, as well as this one. So they're the gurus on this topic. But what they really focus on in this particular book, and I bring out some activities from it, is the um, how do what is important to the boss and how do we build that relationship with the boss to be able to influence them. I always ask in my classes what is one of the most important things to be able to influence other people. And the word I get a lot is trust. So we'll talk about that today as well. Um, but I would like to first I give you another Pause for a moment and give you another uh, little bit of a, a minute to jot down a question I would like to ask everyone. I'd like you to jot down, if you would, on your piece of paper anywhere in front of you, what language your boss talks uh, uses when he talks or she. What is the most common thing they talk about? There's probably two or three things, so feel free to write down a couple of things. But what's important to them? I'll give you a minute to write down, that down. What do they value? All right, well, Alan Cohen and David Bradford, if you have a chance to read their book, and I encourage you to do so, they introduce the concept of currency. Whatever that boss values is possibly what he or she is talking about throughout the day periodically. If you don't know what your boss or upper management value, I encourage you to listen. So take a day, pick a normal, typical day that at work, and you interact with your boss or upper management on a regular basis, just that's a pretty normal frequency on that day. And jot down on a piece of paper every time you hear them talk about something, whether it be the finances, if that's important, um, the customers, if that's important, the quality, if that's the critical thing that they value. And jot that down, and at the end of the day, tally up and see what's the most critical. And then here's my question for you. Here's the look in the mirror piece. Do the same for yourself a day later, a week later. What is it you value? Maybe you want to do your day first, because possibly what's happening and it's going to be important to the next piece of this is you're not talking their language. You're not their currency, if you will. If, if your conversations and you're look, looking at influencing them and you're linking into your conversations things that are not what they value, you're not going to get their attention. They're also not going to have that confidence in your ability to share and influence with them. So try that activity. I think you'll find it interesting. And uh, it goes more in depth in the book, but I think it's an, and in our training class. But it is an interesting concept. So let me if you, ask you, if you would, on your handout, if you turn to the back, if you put it at, printed it face um, front and back, or if you second page, however you printed it out, you're going to see right from Cohen and Bradford's book how an, a, a very powerful list of how to build a partnership relationship with your boss. So what I'd love for you to do is you can put check star X's through this, or you can rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 as to how you are doing with your relationship with your boss in each of these nine areas. They're very powerful, and I'd like to go through them, or excuse me, 10 areas, but i go through them together with you. All right, so let's start with the first one. Examining your own beliefs or barriers. Looking at yourself. Pick, um, look at your interaction after a meeting that you have with your boss, uh, and we walk out of that meeting. Ask yourself these three questions, and do it immediately, because that's where it's going to be, high, um, it's going to be heavy on your mind. You know, do you have any beliefs or actions that prohibit the partnership? When you walk out of that room, are you had? Did you make an effort to understand what they have? Did you what their what is their currency? What they value? Um, those are the type of questions that you want to do some self-examination. I promise you, if you don't have beliefs, 
possibly you're demonstrating that through your words, your comments, your interactions with your boss, and that will be prohibiting any ability to do influencing. Do you have the partnership-like mindset? Do you <clears throat> do you do you have that con uh, that attitude that um, you are a partner with your boss, not that he or she um, is responsible for making the relationship work, but you have 50% of that responsibility. And are you giving 100% of that 50% of that relationship? So that's the important component. Many, many of the times I work with people, they, they say, well, it's my boss's responsibility. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. In reality, I say, are you giving forth your 100% of that 50% of that relationship? So that's an important um, uh, self-evaluation piece to do. Again, rate yourself on a scale of one to five on each of these, um, five being the highest. Where's an area that you could continue to develop in building that relationship with your boss? So that in turn, you're able to use some of the techniques effectively to influence them. The third one, you're, and this is a huge one, when I facilitate the program, many people come in and feel that their boss should, should be, and I use the should word because it's highly judgmental, perfect. And that's not reality. So the question that we should be asking instead of criticizing the boss is what can I do to help them to be more effective? The better they look, the better I look. And that goes along with number four. What is the gap between me and my boss? Do we have different a level of authority? And what is that different level of authority? If they can make this is different decisions on the financial um, decision making piece at X dollar uh, level, what is my dollar level? What is that gap? And being very clear on that. And then that's what I, um, number five is an interesting one. Stop giving away your potential power. Many people will also come to me and play what I call the victim role. I had a client yesterday play that role with me, where they were like, well, my boss didn't do this, and my boss didn't do that, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, let's, let's not give away that power. You have the authority to do certain things. You have the, there's a gap. You've identified the gap. You know where your responsibility lies and where their responsibility lies. But playing the victim and constantly going to the boss and asking permission and playing that is only leading into the micromanagement piece. So make those decisions. If you have that authority and you have that power, take that power and move forward. Number six, understanding the boss's world and their situation. Super important. This goes back to um, you know, understanding where they're at. You know, a lot of times people will say to me, to my boss micromanager. And I question if they're withholding information from them and not communicating, and that's usually 99% of the time, that's usually what I find out after coaching a few sessions with my clients, is that they're not keeping the boss abreast of information because they're afraid the boss is going to micromanage. Come to an agreement as to what you want to talk to the boss about on your set agendas, in your one-on-ones, and then give them that information. Withholding the information is only going to make them run back. Set up checkpoints, set up timelines where you'll meet with them and talk to them about a project or whatever it might be so that they know what is they need to know to be able to respond to their bosses. So this is a little bit of a, again, looking in the mirror and saying, am I withholding it because I don't want them to micromanage, but then on the flip side, it's causing them to micromanage. So have that open, difficult possibly conversation, maybe not, about what is it boss you want to know. How frequently should we touch base on this? How can I communicate to this to you? And move on. Number seven, when you do have a concern, and everybody has a concern about things, um, how do you raise that with your boss in a way that's non-blaming? What words am I using? Am I using judgmental words? Am I using words that are open-ended, participative, like one of the third one I mentioned to you earlier of the nine techniques that is one of the most powerful ones in dealing with upper management? So figuring out how to, and practicing your presentation of something that might be bothering you that the boss is doing, or some concern that you might have. Jot those down on the bullet points on a sticky note. Put that sticky note in your lap and walk in and talk to the boss. But choose words that are careful. Watch your body language. And number eight, your part in any difficult situation. This is tough. Everybody wants to be the play the victim again and blame the boss. But is there something I'm doing that's triggering the boss? and possibly have a conversation with them. How is our relationship working? What can I do differently? How can we interact and communicate in a more positive manner? Number nine, accepting the boss's concerns as legitimate. So these are things, again, where sometimes we feel the boss is being petty, or maybe upper management is, and it's a difficult conversation. 
but legitimizing what the issues are bringing up and not talk about the, the reasons behind that they're bringing that to you and understanding how you can then move forward and what you can do in the future to change any behaviors or concerns that they might have. And last and most least, most, uh, most important goes along with the earlier ones is not to undermine yourself. When the boss is giving you feedback, let's, uh, what I encourage my clients to do is not be defensive. Thank them for that information. Take notes. Ask them how, what ideas they have for change. Tell them you need time to absorb it. Come back the next session, uh, next time you're interacting with a plan. Not blaming others. Taking accountability. Talking about how you can respond to something. Now we were all taught as we moved into leadership positions to walk in with solutions, not um, complaining. And that goes to this one right now. Walk in with two or three ideas and solutions when you bring an issue to or a problem to the boss. And of course, the last ones you'll see there is making sure that both of you, you both have that conversation and you're specific about who's going to do what when. That communication is critical. Um, exploring if something does bother you with the boss, what are those things? And what are the issues and how can you both overcome those? So hopefully you had a chance to rate yourself on a scale of one to five because these types of um, items lead to that trust in the relationship and building that strong a relationship with the boss so that you are able to influence them as you implement some of the nine techniques that we talked about earlier. So there are the nine techniques. Um, if another activity that I will mention that we can that you could do is ask a buddy or a mentor that you have to help evaluate you if they do see you interact with the bosses. If they don't see you interact with the bosses, of course you'll have to do some self evaluation. But there's nothing. Uh, you know, there's a, it's a great opportunity for you to get feedback though if you do have a mentor or a partner that can help you give some feedback and some ideas, and you can talk specifically about each of these ten ideas and where you feel you are with your boss. All right, so let me take some questions. Okay, Amy, we did have a, a question come in asking, what approach should I use when it is difficult to get time with my boss? And when I do get some time with him, it is very brief. Usually I feel rushed and that I am bothering him and that I often feel intimidated. Uh, great question, great question. So the, the first thing I would do say to you um, is participation. Go back and look at that participation. Um, be very short in your conversations with your boss. Uh, possibly they're more analytical and they're looking more for that short, brief conversation. So possibly ask them, when can I have three minutes um, to go over these four items? If you give quantitative numbers, sometimes people appreciate that. But asking that uh, question, what works for you, boss? Three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, possibly uh, you could ask them for coffee, take them all away from their office if they're constantly looking on their computer while you're talking. But I would definitely encourage you to set, uh, give them give them the feel that you're not going to take a lot of time, but you just have two or three key things. And then if they do have more time, then of course continue into uh, other items that you have. But go into the meeting with um, specific items listed out and recognize that you're probably only going to get to the top two. So share with them the top two most important ones, and then you can always ask if there's another time. But it sounds like to me that participation is going to work for you because that boss is busy and they need to feel they're in control, and that technique will work the best. Thank you for the question. Okay, another question, Amy, that came in is that I am new to the organization and I'm not sure of the boss's styles. I do, I do have some ideas for improvements, but I'm not sure how to approach him. Okay. Great question. So the first thing I would do is if you're in a meeting with the boss, let's say there even there's eight or nine other people in the meeting, listen to the boss and figure out what they value, i.e. the currency, as well as which technique they're using to influence you. Typically, we use the same technique that influences us on others. So that would be my first clue. If they're going into a meeting, they're logically giving you facts and figures and trying to influence this is the, the direction I want my team to go into, that's a dead giveaway that that logic is most important to them. If they're walking into the meeting, they're talking about the future, or won't our company be great when we implement this new strategy or this new process, they're inspirational. Participative set leaders will come in and say, hey, what do you guys think? What are your ideas? Let's all make a consensus um, leadership decision. Uplift is 
possibly is where they may be complimenting you, but I really doubt that one's your box in the group. Um, you're not going to see that come out. But that would be my suggestion. Start watching the boss, start listening to them. The other thought, my second immediate thought on that one would be to go to someone who's worked for your boss before, a peer who may be working for your boss as well, and ask them, what, uh, what do they value? What, are the, what technique does the boss use for you, on you, so to speak? And that's probably, again, the default. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. But being new can be tough because you're learning but it does give you the opportunity, though, to do a lot of listening, and so that can help you. Right. Okay, another one. Let's see here. Can you give us more examples of mixing two or, th um, or two or three influence tools? Absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. So, what we can? I love to use the inspiration. So, inspiration. We will start with it. So let's say I'm rolling out, I'm in marketing, and I'm rolling out a new project, and I want the senior management to approve that project. I should say I want approval. So I'm from making a proposal to them. I will start off that conversation with, won't it be great when my organization, let's say, doubles in size or opens a new building, and um, we have new, more people come to the building? And then I would immediately go into uh, logic. Here's the reasons behind the money piece of that. Here's the investment. Here's what the projected uh, revenues will be. And then I would immediately, if I'm presenting this to a senior team, dive into the participation. What do you all think? What concerns do you see? Lots of open-ended questions right there to get that senior team on board and bought in to my new presentation or my presentation of expanding the building or the company or the size of the project. So hopefully that helps. But that's using three, actually. That's inspiration first. So talking about want to be great, here's the future, maybe even showing a visual of the of how it will be wonderful when we grow, and then immediately calling back up with the logic, the dollars it's going to cost to do this growth piece, and the revenue it will bring in, and then asking the open-ended questions, not just what questions you have about my presentation, but questions around getting them involved. What do you think? How do you see this? What have I missed? What are the barriers? How will we overcome the barriers, et cetera? All right, we got another one? Yes, we do. How do I influence my direct reports who have worked for the company longer than I have and tend to undermine my authority when I try to manage them? All right, very good question. I hear that frequently in my program. So the with the um, if they've been there a long time, then I'm guessing uplift may or may not work because uplift is complimenting them and letting them know you can count on the next time. Possibly those that have been there a long time are what we call the um, the, the, I use them the one foot out the door. They're just fighting time until they're leaving. So that one's not going to work for them, possibly. Um, it, it, it could. You can try it. But I would go back to participation with them. I would get them involved, make them feel special, make them feel that they have information that others need, um, putting them in that kind of working, um, you know, you've been here a long time. What ideas do you have? How can you help? How can I, you know, here's my goal. Here's my expectation. How can you help me achieve that? The other one you could do with them is the deal. Um, you know, if you help me out on this, um, this will be re in return or the favor. But those would be the four I would try. Uplift, probably, you can certainly try it if they're new, but you mentioned in your question that they've been there a while. So I would definitely start off with participation then. So those would be the four I would go for, though. Okay, we had a similar question um, about when your direct reports undermine your authority and actually go around you and go right to the owner. Mm -hmm. like that one. Okay. So that's a great question. When they undermine you and go around to the authority, well, that's where my mediation comes into play. Sometimes it may, makes sense for everyone to meet together. But the first thing I would say to, to you is I'll go back to that for um, participation. Is, you know, how, when you have your meetings and you interact with them, what are some of their concerns? Um, when I one of the things I teach in coaching and it kind of goes back to what Bradford and Cohen are talking about in their book. There's got to be a relationship. When your employees are undermining you and going around um, to the boss, there's no relationship there. They feel they want their way and they feel you're in the way. So they don't feel that you're able to help them. So my first thing would be is to build a relationship with them, spend a little bit of time with them, ask them some of the concerns, get to know them on a personal level as well, and then demonstrate to them that you're going to take those concerns and it might be taking them with you to the owner and um, sharing with them that you have uh, you are trying and you're working with the owner 
on the issues, giving them current updates as to where you're going with the, the issue, whatever it might be. But that would be my biggest concern for, or my biggest recommendation for you is that relationship. They're going around you because they're, they don't feel, number one, there's a relationship with you, or number two, that you're doing anything to help them. So sometimes it also makes sense to have the, a, a meeting with all of you and talk about their concerns. But hopefully you can go to the owner and you can encourage the owner to come back to you and that owner doesn't take it and go with it, that he involves you, that will help your credibility piece. And if he's not doing that, I would ask, I would encourage you to ask the owner to keep you involved so that you are aware and that you can have a meeting and you use the participation technique to have lots of great conversations. Okay, we got a lot of good questions coming in. Next one, my boss's boss is very difficult and my boss typically uses this as an excuse for things not going as planned. Meeting time changes, ex uh, exclusions from project team managed or project team meetings. How do I influence my boss to include me on important gatherings? Okay, great question. So I think that's, that's a little bit of setting boundaries and sitting with down with the boss and I would use the participation technique. I would plan my questions ahead of time. And I would say, hey, boss, I would like to be a part of these techniques, these particular events, and here's my reason. Now, the reason that you would give them is where you got to be careful on the influencing technique. If your boss is logical, then you got to give them logical reasons. If the boss is participative or uh, inspirational, then you got to give them reasons. So you got to influence based on what it is that, um, what their technique is. I would also talk a little bit about pain or pleasure. I would also talk about how him um, when he's not influencing including you then what what that what is that causing the pain or pleasure um he's creating unfortunately uh him con people constantly coming back to him versus coming to you and also he's undermining your uh, ability to lead so i would share with him those thoughts in a very careful manner and say my questions ahead of time but i would use that either logic participation or inspiration whichever the technique is and then talk to them about going forward, how can we do that? People love to get ideas for the future. People hate to be proven wrong. So whatever I, you do, I would not encourage, I would encourage you not to come across as you're judging him or you're blaming him in any way because that will shut him down. Uh, keep everything future focused on how can we work better together? How can I be a stronger leader? More of that inspiration in your conversation, in your portion of it. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Um, we have uh, no more questions, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. So I do want to thank everybody for joining us this morning, and I want to thank Amy Shannon for being here. Um, if you would like to learn more about today's topic, Influencing Up, I do encourage you to register for Amy's public program on either December 13th or March 20th, and both programs will be delivered at the Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio which is located in Independence, Ohio. You can see the registration link on your screen. We can also tailor this program and all of our programs um, specifically for your organization and bring it to your site. You can contact us at the number on your screen, which is 330-672-3416, or email us at yourtrainingpartner@kent.edu. We also encourage you to register for our next web webinar, which is an overview of Lean Six Sigma and how to think about data with Kent State Facilitator Steve Skillman on Monday, November 19th at 2 o'clock p.m. For those attending live, you will be asked to complete a short survey. Please complete this survey so that we can be assured that we are bringing you the most usable and relevant content possible. Thank you again for attending and have a great day.